The next panel is all about balance. And what was amazing about the last panel was sort of how reasonable everyone was. How we talked about, this is a scary time and there are outrageous things happening, but we've got to find a way to get to the middle to get things to really move. You know, when we don't do enough, people argue and we say, we're rationalizing bad behavior. It's not about rationalizing it. It's about finding a middle ground to start to really create hope, which is what that last quote we just had up here was. Um, the next person leading uh, this important panel, Ian Urbina from the New York Times, is an investigative journalist focused on Ocean Outlaw. That's his last series. What a cool name for it. Extraordinary things, outrageous things happening offshore. I'm talking about illegal fishing, intentional dumping, sea slavery, things that you don't think about in your everyday life because there's no sea slaves in your backyard. Um, when you walk your kid to school, he or she isn't really thinking or talking about all the illegal fishing, fishing that's happening and that we could see extraordinary species wiped off our planet. Ian's work every day does just that. Some of his uh, writing has been turned into feature films, and his focus is to bring those stories here. So at the very least, we're thinking about them, talking about them, and hopefully, hopefully inspiring change. Let's welcome Ian. <laughs> Thank you very much. So the last panel in many ways was a look back. This panel I think will look forward uh, and ask the same overarching question of the events of the weekend. Um, what does balance look like? Um, you know, as has been stated before um, and I'm sure will be stated again, uh, by 2050 we're looking at two billion more people. Um, uh, on the planet, uh, and with that increased population, we'll be facing a lot tougher questions with a greater sense of urgency. Uh, so these panelists are going to engage in a discussion here about how in their distinct lines of work, and you'll hear in a second what, that, what those lines are, these, the, the core question of what does balance look like comes up and how they attempt to grapple with it. So let me introduce these panelists, um, if they would come out now. <laughs> the Von Trapp family. <laughs> so Natalie Kofler, molecular biologist, go ahead and sit down, um, is a molecular biologist and the founder and director of Editing Nature at Yale University, a global initiative to steer responsible development and deployment of environmental genetic technologies. At Editing Nature, she builds processes and platforms to guide projects that aim to genetically alter wild species with goals such as preventing disease transmission, eliminating invasive species, or aiding species adaptive adaptability to changing climates. Next, we have Mustafa Santiago Ali, Mustafa is a renowned national speaker, policymaker, community liaison, trainer, and, and facilitator. He specializes in social and environmental justice issues and is focused on using a holistic approach to revitalize vulnerable communities. Further down the line, we have Jess Cramp. Jess advises national governments, foundations, and NGOs in marine reserve and fisheries policy in the Pacific and is the founder of Shark Specific, a nonprofit organization dedicated to shark and fisheries research, outreach, education, and advocacy. And lastly, we have Jonathan Bailey. Jonathan is National Geographic Society's chief scientist, senior vice president of science and exploration, and vice chair of the Committee for Research and Exploration. He's also a visiting professor at University of Oxford. So, when I moderate panels like this, I usually prefer to uh, offer up some broad questions and have each panelist just tell me a little bit or tell us um, how those questions play out in their specific work. Um, again, I think on the, on the broadest level, the things that interest me and hopefully you uh, are how do we know when we're in balance, who decides, uh, and when specifically in your line of work uh, 
that these questions of balance come up. Um, so why don't we just start with you, um, uh, Natalie, and, and just tell a little bit about more specifically your work. Sure. Um, thank you, and thanks for having us today for this really important conversation. Um, so as you mentioned, and actually I believe Emma brought this up in the previous panel, um, there's decisions being made right now um, all over the world about thinking about using new genetic technologies, particularly uh, CRISPR gene editing, which can basically change the DNA of, of any living thing very easily um, and inexpensively um, to impact wild species. Um, and so there's ideas around using um, CRISPR gene editing to change mosquitoes so that they wouldn't be able to carry malaria. Um, using this to suppress certain invasive species, um, as well as provide potentially resiliency to species like coral reefs uh, to withstand raising sea temperatures. Um, these have huge implications for our ecosystems and for, and for society, and so we really think a lot about what does a balanced decision look like um, when, when we're dealing with these complex issues of using these technologies. Um, and so, when I think about balance, or I prefer sometimes to use the word integration or, or kind of combining things, um, on a personal level, I think a lot about um, balancing our intellect with our heart. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and, um, and how do we really bring in our values and our emotions and what's important to us and when we're making these scientific decisions. Um, and also balancing decisions with diverse worldviews and, and opinions on these technologies. So we think a lot about how do we include historically marginalized communities in these decisions? How do we include the people who would be most directly impacted by, the, by these decisions? How do we include future generations um, in those thoughts? Or even the values of the non-human um, voice in those decisions? So we really try and take a really sort of inclusive approach um, to how these technologies are gonna be developed and deployed. And just one follow up on that. It, when you come to some resolution, um, <laughs> if, if ever that occurs yeah. uh, on these issues, what happens next? Do, do you have any authority to Im impose um, this? Well, yeah, so I should, advisory? I should preface this that this is really new, uh, very new. We're kind of at the very beginning of the use of these technologies. So there hasn't been a point yet where we've even gotten to a point of, of coming to some sort of consensus that's happening now. Um, but I think you bring up a good point that consensus is easy when you have just a few people in the room with relatively similar viewpoints on how things should be done. Um, <laughs> consensus becomes <laughs> infinitely more challenging when you have more voices at the table. Um, but I do think that diverse voices at the table is so critical to make responsible decisions with these technologies um, and ensure they're used to the benefit and not, and not detriment of our planet. Um, so, so the jury's still out on what <laughs> consensus really looks like mm -hmm. in that situation. Um, and I, I wanna come back to um, how we move not just beyond consensus, but beyond conversation and to application mm -hmm. uh, and sort of the thorny transition that often comes there um, yeah. uh, in figuring out how to impose some of these decisions. Um, but Mustafa, just talk a little bit about your work Mm -hmm. these days and, and where balance comes up? Sure, so uh, I try and simplify things for folks. So <laughs> my work is helping our most vulnerable communities move from surviving to thriving. Um, uh, our work has been focused on a number of different communities um, from the Gwich'in people, um, you know, who are just, well, let me, let me say it this way. Everyone hopefully saw the NOAA study that came out just a few days ago that talks about um, how the ice caps are, you know, melting three times faster than in 2007. But lots of times we don't then connect that work with what's really happening to real people on the ground. The Gwich'in folks, um, indigenous brothers and sisters, are dealing with the losing their culture, losing their culture because the caribou are now moving in a different direction, losing their culture because of traditional transportation routes that they used to take they can no longer do, um, and all the other things that come along in that space. So my work is also focused on places like Flint and the 3,000 other locations across the country um, that have higher levels of lead in them. And, and how do we begin to replace uh, in position a balancing where this is not uh, something that has become commonplace for folks? And also the connections that exist in that space of the pipelines that run from Canada that end up in places like the Manchester community or in Port Arthur, Texas, where the hurricanes came through 
but these folks on a daily basis cannot have a breath of fresh air. So we've got to find a way to balance this out because these issues are connected to real people dealing with real issues on a daily basis. The other part of my work, um, of course, that everybody finds exciting uh, is the work with the cultural influencers, uh, with those artists and entertainers and athletes whom when they say something, people pay attention to. A great example of that is I can place a thousand of the best scientists here on this stage. We have one of them uh, who's right next to me. Um, and some of us might, you know, take away some of the things, but I guarantee you that if I had Beyonce standing here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> not for long, not for long. <laughs> yeah. everybody, would pull, everybody would pull out your phones, wouldn't you? First, can I get a selfie? <laughs> but think about when hurricanes came through in Houston. And then when Beyonce began to talk about why this is important, how this is impacting everyday folks, it begins to shift the culture which for me is another part of hopefully the conversation we'll have around balancing. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's about utilizing those platforms that incredible artists and entertainers have, linking them with scientists who can take folks into a deeper understanding of some of these issues and building bridges between people. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what this is about. Because if we can fix the issues that are happening in our most vulnerable communities, then there's naturally going to be uh, a sort of a better place that all of us will then be able to be at. So for me, those are a couple of the items. And one follow-up. Um, so Mustafa, for many years, was based at the EPA. And, and forgive me if I'm not going to get the exact job title right, but it had to do with environmental justice office within the EPA. Just talk for a second, if you could, about what in applied form that job looks like. Oh, that was, it, it was such a blessing. <laughs> I, I come out of a family of Baptist and Pentecostal ministers. So if y'all hear that, you know what's going on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the reason that it was such a blessing, and it, unfortunately at that time, and hopefully we are evolving um, in our government, and, and I say that you know, with a little tongue in cheek, um, is because the Office of Environmental Justice that I helped found with other folks actually came out of a set of recommendations from stakeholders across the country, from those most vulnerable communities saying that we need an intersection point so that we can have these conversations with the government, so that we can help folks to understand the resources that are necessary to make the changes that we are looking for um, so I started off actually as a student um, and was blessed to have Dr. Clarice Gaylor and Dr. Warren Banks who saw something in this crazy looking uh, young man uh, and invited me into that space. And then all the environmental justice leaders, civil rights leaders and some of the others um, who also. So the work there was about giving voice to those communities who had often been forgotten, who often were marginalized, who often their voices would not be heard, leveraging those resources. Uh, and helping to make real change happen, which is something that we have to be able to do so that folks will then see value in investing in these communities because then they can see tangible results that actually happen. Um, and then at the end, uh, when I submitted my resignation letter, um, I was the assistant associate administrator at the Environmental Protection Agency uh, focusing on environmental justice and community revitalization. Great, so now we're gonna move far away to the Pacific, um, so just, Talk to me a little bit, or us, about um, Cook Islands and, and the work you do. So I um, made a conscious decision to base myself in the Cook Islands in 2011. And that was um, a little bit based on a hunch, but based on some experience I'd had as, uh, as a young, naive, wannabe do-gooder, <laughs> recovering lab scientist, um, that we could put our scientific training to better use on the planet. But what I understood very quickly, I spent some time in Haiti and, and about a year in Panama, was that unless I really became integrated in these communities, you know, uh, going overseas and, and spitting facts wasn't even remotely going to address the problem, but wasn't even understanding what those people wanted or needed. So, so in 2011, I moved to the Cooks and, um, and started understanding that we have people with this incredible traditional knowledge. And, um, and there were some fisheries challenges that were occurring. And one of those was the potential to begin exploiting sharks that may not have been um, able to be exploited sustainably. And um, in my work, you know, we had some policy success. But throughout that, I realized that there are an unbelievable number of trade-offs that both politicians and the people who live there need to consider and make. And now I work, and I work in marine conservation and policy and research. Um, but I try to do that in a responsible way that includes both the values and needs and cultural traditions of the community, but in a way that includes also the science, which says, hey, you know, maybe some of these species can't be fished in a way that's sustainable, or maybe 
hey, I know that you've been fishing in this area for you know, 100 years, but you're gonna have no clams left if you continue to harvest in this way. So I try to build relationships first and understand uh, what people need and what they have done for centuries and, and where their frustrations are and try to combine that with the science to create a policy that is actually impactful and sustainable both for the people who live there and also the, you know, the biodiversity and the planet that we still need to have in balance. Mm -hmm. And I know very little about the Cook Islands, so um, forgive me that. Um, but just talk to me a little bit about um, why sharks and what, I think your term trade-offs is a really good one um, for this discussion because it, to me, feels like a grittier, more sober version of balance, which is a feel-good one. Um, so talk to me about the trade-offs, and balance is a great goal, but trade-offs is a harder thing to reckon with. What, what have been some of the trade-offs you've had to um, swallow uh, in, in advocating for conservation? Sure. Um, this is actually a really easy one for me because the Cook Islands are, you know, they're a large ocean state, so we don't like to call ourselves a small island developing state. And, um, you know, there are just under maybe 15,000 people that live there, but they have an EEZ, so all of their waters are, you know, the size of Texas. And they don't have an, you know, a, a bustling economy, and their 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 economy is driven by both tourism but also fisheries. And so there's a very real need to, you know, they're trying to reduce their reliance on aid. You know, this next year they may graduate, you know, from being a, a third world country, and and they have to fund their programs. Children need schools. They need roads. Um, <laughs> And, and it's one thing to go in and say, look, all the fish are dying and, and, and you know, we need to stop fishing, but in reality, this country needs to fuel its future generations and give them opportunities. And, and those opportunities aren't always gonna come from, from saving everything. So that is a very real trade-off that I consistently discuss with politicians. And, and for me, just being honest about that and saying, look, I know that you're trying to balance these economic, sociocultural, and environmental decisions and in this instance, for example, like say with this species of shark, which is an easy one because I call sharks kind of the gateway drug to the oceans. Mm. <laughs> People get really either excited about them or they hate them, but I find you can kind of discuss greater fisheries or climate issues through that lens. But um, anyway, I use that as the hook, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> thanks, I'll be here all day. No, um, but anyway, I, I just find that I, I can if I'm more honest about those trade-offs that people have to make, I feel like we make more progress in that way toward a more sustainable, balanced planet um, for both the people. Mm -hmm. um, animals. So let's go big picture, Jonathan. Okay. Since uh, you know, um, you're the chief scientist and in many ways orchestrating all of content and direction uh, on this issue of balance. Um, could you give me a couple examples within the National Geographic space where you've already begun working towards um, educating the public and even advocating for balance? Sure. Um, but I want to start by just addressing really what balance is when we talk about it, especially from a natural, National Geographic perspective. It's really a metaphor for a healthy and sustainable planet. And some people obsess about exactly what is that balance. And the reality is we don't know, but we know what balance isn't. And we know that balance isn't about 20% of the world's species threatened with extinction. We know that balance isn't us converting more than half the planet. We know that balance isn't a greater than 50% decline since 1970. We know that balance isn't um, you know, if you divide biomass up, having 60% of biomass for, for livestock and 36% for humans and 4% for the rest of life of, of the mammal world, if that's tigers, elephants, rhinos, that's not balance. We know that balance isn't, um, when you look at all, all uh, birds, 60% of bird biomass being poultry, basically chickens. So we know that that isn't. So we're trying to drive in the direction of balance. and. Um, if I was sort of pushed to say exactly what is that, I would say, well, it's something like maintaining the wonderful diversity of life that was here when we were all born. Or um, it's something like uh, maintaining the wonderful diverse cultures on, on the planet that we have or maintaining the engine of life. And we really have to accept our ignorance in this process. We don't know how many species there are. We don't know how these species interact and the benefits we receive. We don't know the impact of things like climate change and uh, the multiple emerging threats that are coming forward. 
So in that ignorance, we have to be a little bit careful and we have to say, how do we keep this engine of life going? Um, and National Geographic uh, is such a wonderful platform to think about these issues and try and help uh, push society in the right direction. And we've set it up so that we can um, really start by uh, trying to influence people's values and then trying to maintain the engine of life. And then going from there uh, to try and drive innovation. And then we do that through uh, basically exploration. How is the world benefiting us? Why is it so special? Getting that into the educational system, getting it out to our 750 million viewers, um, and then um, ultimately changing behavior and, and, and empowering people. But some of the special projects we have are, th are things like Pristine Seas. And we have an explorer, Enrique Sala, who came to us with an idea and said, um, you know, our, our oceans aren't in balance. You look at the oceans, and uh, when he was starting, you had less than 1% of the oceans really protected. And uh, on land, we have about 15% uh, protected, and that's, that's not enough. But how do we get into a world where we're actually securing the, the diversity um, of our oceans? And so he started with the science, he went out, but he also brought in the storytelling. And he's brought these magical places to life, and he's brought them to the public, and he's brought them to policymakers. And we've had announcements over the years, which in total, working in partnership with others, have resulted in five million kilometers squared, or over five million kilometers squared, um, under protection. And uh, that's half the size of Canada. And then you say, well, what are the benefits for people in that? Well, the reality is they've shown that if you secure these areas, it allows the, the biodiversity, the fish, to thrive. And in fact, there's more resources for people to benefit from, uh, especially in local com communities where they have to come off the shores and, and fish for, for, for their livelihoods. But it also allows for the great diversity of life to exist in the future. So that's just one example of mm -hmm. the type of project. It's a perfect seg to the next question I had, which was perhaps contrarian and perverse. But um, uh, I would love to flip the whole notion upside down and ask, um, are there any scenarios in any of your work where balance is the wrong choice, where uh, radical action is needed um, and moderation is actually going to be um, detrimental? Uh, clearly, just conceptually, one way I can see that being the case is what is balanced for these players is out of balance for these players, and it's all a matter of perspective as to what you're calling balance for whom. Um, but let me put it to you guys. Um, can we turn it on its head and argue that there are times and places where balance is really not a great idea? <laughs> Mustafa, go for it. I knew you would, I, I lobbed that one up right in the middle. I was trying to be really. <laughs> I mean, you, what you're really talking about, the environmental injustices that exist. Mm -hmm. And we have to be extremely careful because sometimes we'll, you know, when I was in the government, we always talked about cost benefit analysis and, you know, the winners and losers. And unfortunately for our most vulnerable communities, they were the ones who were usually on the, you know, on the losing end of that proposition. I want you guys to think about something. Think about the places that I mentioned before, Port Arthur, Texas, the Manchester community, Houston, Texas. If we say we've got to find a balance with the emissions that are coming out, these folks are still going to be disproportionately impacted. If you go to the Manchester community, I hope you'll Google this afterwards or Google it now. If you go to that community, you literally, let me ask this. Everybody do me a favor. Everybody take a deep breath and let it out. Now, I want you to think about something because that's an autonomic response. We do it all the time. There are far too many places in our country where you can't take a breath of fresh air. In the Manchester community, because of all the refineries that are there, you literally go there and you feel like you're breathing gasoline fumes. So how do you find a balance in that situation of saying, well, instead of every day you feel like you're breathing in gasoline fumes, you know, every other day you can have some fresh air. And that's, you know, sometimes the crazy thinking that we have in the creation of policy and, and trying to do these benefit analysis and those types of things. And you can literally, and these communities reach out and touch the piping that exists in the community from their front and back porches. When people talk about frontline communities, it becomes no real, realer than when you go to our most vulnerable communities and they're dealing with these situations. So the question you asked, we have to be really careful when we start talking about the winners and losers and, and how much is acceptable. In our country, there should not be anyone 
who can't have clean air or clean water. It just does not make any sense. And for me, if that is a part of the analysis and we're saying, well, some folks won't be able to do that, then I think we need to change the model. And as you said, flip it on its head maybe um, to say that's unacceptable. And let me force a pivot on, on that. And I'm coming. Oh, gosh. To, um, <laughs> in your comfort zone, um, mosquitoes and genetically altering mosquitoes. Yeah. And you mentioned something when we were talking before about something I'd heard vaguely about previously. I don't know much about it, but in New Zealand, rodents that are wiping out certain populations <laughs> and these teams that come in and attempt to tackle the problem by killing one type of rodent. And I remember thinking when I was hearing this, that sounds really controversial. Yeah. And, Questionable. So I guess the question is, um, are there any s um, scenarios yeah. from a species perspective where a radical action to obliterate one type of species or one s component like malaria carrying mosquitoes might actually be the ethical choice or is that never the case? Well, no. So I think um, those are the questions that I grapple with all the time. And um, both of them, ha it's really this true idea of a double-edged sword. Um, and in the case of, of malaria, for example, oh, approximately 450,000 people die every year of malaria. 75% of them are children under the age of five. So there's huge, um, huge impacts of trying to find really effective solutions to preventing disease transmission. And so in that situation, you're, you're, balance, you're weighing this decision of having human life being able to be saved but also the potential for enormous unintended consequences to ecosystems, which also support human life. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're really dealing with these really <laughs> complicated questions all the time. And how do, we, how do we navigate them to ensure that we do right by these technologies? Um, I think another thing that we think a lot about is this idea of sort of toggling between the local and the global perspective. Yeah. Um, because you you know if you if you are a mother in a rural village in Burkina Faso, you are going to want to do all that you can to ensure that one of your you know four children does not die from malaria. And so you're going to have very different opinions about whether you want to go ahead and use this technology, versus someone who's an environmentalist based in Chicago thinking about ecological impacts in a different way. And another really interesting example is as you mentioned New Zealand. They have invasive predators. So New Zealand did not have a single predator um, on, on the island um, for, you know, as, as evolution occurred. And so there's all these birds that lay eggs on the ground. Um, and when you bring in weasels or different possums, um, it's really having huge impacts on some of their native species. What if New Zealand decides to, you, to release a genetically engineered possum to that would then sort of suppress all possums in New Zealand? which has come over from Australia, where Australian Aboriginals see, hold this possum as something sacred. Mm -hmm. And so if that possum were to get back to Australia and eliminate their possums there, you could have, again, this huge issue. So we're really having to balance local needs, but having also consideration of others and global impacts of those of decisions. Mm -hmm. Sharks. Um. <laughs> it seems like a strange segue from what Natalie said, <laughs> but in fact, um, I was nodding along with you because, <laughs> Thank you. you know, I, I work in an international fisheries arena often, right, where we say, these animals, there is no balance. They need protection, bar none, or we will lose them in our lifetimes. And I'll take one example, and that's an oceanic white tip shark. Once, say again. Oceanic white tip shark. Once one of the most abundant sharks on the planet, I'm studying them for my PhD, and I, I am having a really hard time finding them. Bad decision if you're doing a PhD, pick an animal, you can find it. <laughs> but um, oh, gosh. I also, I just spent. It's okay. okay. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yeah. Excellent. So I have spent time advocating for the protection of this animal, which science has shown needs protection, or we may lose it. However, comma, I just spent two months on a very remote atoll in the Cook Islands called Penryn. And this is a, a community of 150 people. They have a cargo ship maybe once every nine months. They are subsistence fishers. And when they spend one to $40 on a lure to go out and feed their families, and an oceanic white tip shark comes along 
and we call it taxes their catch, what do you think they do? They kill it. So there's sort of a human wildlife conflict in, a, in an arena that we don't often discuss with marine world, but there's also this you know, internal conflict that I have as a scientist and a conservationist and a, a member of the Cook Islands community going, what the hell do I do? You know, like these people really need to feed their families. Um, and then I was finding myself like trying to quantify, okay, well, you know, how many fish did the shark actually take or how often does it actually happen? And when, when you realize that there's this global perspective that this animal needs protection bar none, but then locally, the situation changes when you actually spend time there and you listen and you go, I, I really need to consider how this impacts these people and whether my argument then needs to change or may, maybe the way I feel about it. I just say, I mean, there's also an intergenerational balance. Mm -hmm. So um, my little two-year-old son is here and, and if I think about his, uh, say, granddaughter, and if she was standing here on the stage and we were talking to her, and she would probably say, well, I, I want the same climate that you guys have, and mm. you know, I want the same diversity on the planet that you had, and I want to enjoy that, you know, those amazing species. I want to be able to breathe the same clean air that you guys breathe, um, but you know, current trends are not leading to that, and we're using the resources of future generations. And so we just have to think about that balance as well. Mm -hmm. I think also the idea of balancing history with our future. You know, so I think there's also a lot of histories that need to be brought to the table of what's happened before and unveiling those, unveiling the power structures that have occurred from histories, and ensure that we can sort of help to work through that in what we're gonna create. Mm -hmm. Because I do think I particularly spend a lot of time thinking forward, 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 and, and I am an optimist. I think we can do wonderful things to make a more healthy future for all of us, but we also have to remember where we're, where we're coming from and, and how people have been treated historically and try and, and, heal, and heal that, mm -hmm. those wounds and those um, I think fissures. along the same lines, um, almost methodologically, um, it's a good exercise to constantly force, so if you have a situation in which there's a legitimate dichotomy or trilateral set of tensions maybe, um, and you really have attempted to get a nuanced understanding of the, the lay of the land between those stakeholders, if you will. I think often it's a really good idea to then pull way back from it and say, okay, am I missing any meta picture here? So in my own reporting, I often found this where I was looking at these stakeholders in fishing and on, the, on these ships. and. You know, and I was looking at uh, you know competition between tuna fishermen and and um, coastal authorities, and um, and when I would pull back, I would realize that beyond that marine protected area, if you if you took the lens wider, there was a whole ring of thousands of fish aggregating devices, these floating things in the oceans around there, that were stopping the migratory species to begin with. So these guys were fighting it here, and we were trying to figure out the right balance to strike and telling their story here. But actually upstream from all that conflict was a much bigger <laughs> clash that was going on having to do with other countries. Mm -hmm. And then if you pulled the lens back Google Earth style, even mm -hmm. bigger, acidification and climate change came into effect, and yeah. you're thinking meta mm -hmm. dumpers of coal in the of carbon in the air over here that are affecting, and so all these policy decisions that are being made to balance these stakeholders might be not in five years because these meta meta players, if you will, or factors are going to you know, wipe out whatever they're fighting over. So I just think methodologically in striking balance, we constantly have to be playing with the lens that yeah. we're looking at it. Um, on that note, I think we're supposed to switch to Q&A, if I'm following my instructions correctly. Um, uh, so. Be a rebel. Yeah, okay, all right. I'm gonna go a minute early, even though I'm looking for guidance, as rebellious as I am. Uh, and I think I'm just gonna call on people, um, if that's how it's supposed to, are there mics that I'm supposed to? <laughs> So why don't, in the white shirt, why don't we start? Hi, um, a question for Natalie. Uh, you're um, genetically, are looking at genetic modification of uh, mosquitoes, et cetera. How about the other side? Uh, cheetahs are supposed to have a um, bottleneck of, um, mm. uh, and golden retrievers, and I guess there are many other instances. Do you go the other way? <laughs> 
so meaning species that are kind of bottlenecking in their genetic diversity. Yeah, so there, I mean, I think we also, I just want to preface. Explain that question. Yeah, more, let I me, okay. <laughs> yeah. I also want to preface this that these technologies are really early on right now. It's only in labs, it's being developed, nothing's been released, so we have time to really think about this and make sure, don't, so don't. Don't, don't panic think, yet. You don't think it's scary yet, but be aware. Um, so there's, there, are these, um, there are these ideas of using these technologies um, to promote resiliency to species that might be threatened. And so one thing that can create a very um, imbalanced situation for, for, for species that are limited in number um, is what would be bottlenecking of genetic diversity. Um, and so there are ideas of using uh, gene editing to be able to expand the amount of diversity within a small population so that you could actually kind of give that population or species a boost to be able to withstand and evolve and change to address, you know, different pressures that they're facing. If that's, I think, what I'm, yes. Are there any downsides to doing that? Um, I, well, I think maybe the downside, and you brought this up, is how little we know about things. Mm. Um, and so I think what could be real, what unnerves me is us, I say us because I'm not actually doing this, but scientists or developers of these technologies going in thinking they completely understand the genome of, you know, some monk seal in the Caribbean and deciding that if we just do this, 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 that should be fine. And as we know, nature is much more complex than that. Um, and so I do worry that sometimes that that isn't um, fully um, always appreciated when those decisions are being made. More questions. Um. Hello, I'm Dalia. Uh, basically, one of the things that I wanted to ask is like, for me, balance is about also ownership. So like, you have to have the ownership of the people and the politics whenever you think about balance. Mm -hmm. So in your, uh, for me, this is a challenging thing. Like, how can we ensure that balance is sustained when you have different politics at the local or the mm -hmm. global level sometimes, and when you have socioeconomical challenges? Thank you. I think uh, it's a good statement uh, and echoes much of what, uh, especially you were saying, um, more than a question. So why don't we? I, mm. just, just on that, I think um, it would be nice for us to develop some consensus around some goals that we're aiming towards as a society and, and embed them and have governments across the world agree to those. Um, and there's many forums to do that, but for example, uh, there were the 2020 targets, which kind of outlined how much we should protect of the planet. And there was one goal for 10% of the ocean and another goal um, for 17% of the land. And now it's an opportunity to renew that. And how do we find out what society generally wants in terms of protecting the natural world and how do we set these targets together and then have a framework which we all kind of accept is, is what we're aiming for. And I think what we're lacking at this point in history is a common vision of that healthy and sustainable planet and then the actual steps we need to take to get there. And I think that's all something we need to get better at doing um, and get broader buy-in to that vision that this is where we want to be and these are the steps we need as a society to get there, uh, and that's going to look after the, you know, the equity both on the short term and the long term and maintain that overall balance. Mm -hmm. Let me go to this side of the room in the very back. Uh, good morning. Thank you. My name is Daniel. Uh, Jonathan made a really interesting comment that I think was echoed in other comments about having to come to grips with our ignorance on a lot of these issues. Um, but if anything, this week has felt like a celebration of human cleverness. <laughs> and I'm a student of biomimicry, and Janine Benyus, who many of you probably know, um, talks about quieting human cleverness. And I wonder in your explorations, whether they're with vulnerable communities or with the, in the Cook Islands or elsewhere, where have we seen wisdom coming from indigenous communities? Where have we seen wisdom coming from Mother Earth herself mm. um, that we could be drawing on to reach towards this balance? Thank mm -hmm. you. Can I take that one? <laughs> I, think, I, I think that question must have been written by us and planted. <laughs> yeah. The most Thank amazing you. love I've ever seen. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, especially in the work that I do, these people have inhabited these islands for thousands of years. And in fact, exactly what Ian was talking about, that meta view, in fact, that meta view comes right from uh, traditional knowledge of, you know, we go out and we talk about, um, you have to protect the shark, or we have to talk about these fish, or you know, we've done all this scientific research, which is important, but in fact, the fishermen have been saying for a long time, I used to catch tuna that were this big, and now they're this big. 
or we used to have a group responding aggregation there, and it happened when the moon was here, but now, in fact, the tide is higher, and the, the grouper are gone, but we see these species. And so there's an enormous amount of traditional knowledge, even that is scientific, um, that can help us drive decisions, but un, un, not unfortunately, I wouldn't say everywhere, but a lot of times, the people making the decisions are unwilling to accept that as fact, I and mean, we've never seen any of that in our own country. Um, but in fact, I, I find that the more you try to be that bridge, you know, even if sometimes it is like, I'm very aware that I am a white-faced American female working in a Polynesian male-dominated society. But in times, that actually works because, pathetically, the leaders will listen to me as a scientist conveying that story of the traditional knowledge into a way that tries to benefit people. I don't know if I answered your question. But. Yeah. And in the environmental justice context, uh, unfortunately, folks weren't paying attention for generations to what folks said they were seeing happening. You know, we look at the warming of the planet, but we never really ask the question of where does it really come from? So some of those communities I talked about, those and other frontline communities are where our fossil fuel facilities are located. And folks were telling folks, hey, we're having all these crazy impacts that are happening, and now those crazy impacts and the emissions that came from those plants are now warming up our planet. So imagine if we had a time machine and we could go back 30 or 40 years and listen to those folks who are saying, you know, we've got these challenges that are happening and we began to have better policy, better land use planning, um, not locating these facilities in these communities and thinking about how do we, are, are we creating more than we actually need uh, and how do we reduce that? So that's one example. The mother of the environmental justice movement, Hazel Johnson, used to talk about a changing climate and this was in the late 70s, early 80s. And folks were like, ah, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, our farmers have been telling us about the changes that they've been seeing, but because they were in the rural context and they weren't in the middle of the media hubs, sometimes we don't hear that message soon enough. All of these folks who work in or around vulnerable communities have been sharing with us, our indigenous brothers and sisters, continually telling us to get in harmony with Mother Earth, the first principle of the environmental justice, uh, 17 principles, is honoring Mother Earth. If we did that in relationship to our policy, our business development, how we engage uh, with our natural environment and with others, it would change everything. But unfortunately, sometimes, if we don't have a lot of letters after our names, like many of us are blessed to have, we don't hear the people who are actually being impacted on a daily basis, on a generational basis by what's going on, we have to change that dynamic if we want to get into balance with the planet and with the people. And we can do it. We just have to decide that's what we actually want to do. I would throw in one additional complicating factor, which is that my impression having worked as an anthropologist before being a journalist, is that there's often a Western assumption that these other communities are monoliths, mm -hmm. and that what they say is a singular thing that, and even often in a liberal sort of gaze, is right. And when you get there, wherever the there is, you quickly find out it's not a monolith, it's not universally right, it's not even always in the interests of that own community, and as, even if you can get over the hurdle of imposing your own perspective and set of policy agenda, and you can listen to the community, you quickly realize that the community is very divided and you have to suss out what mm -hmm. part of the community you're going to wait. And that's another challenge, layer of difficulty that I know everyone knows, but um, let's just, try. Yeah. I just said that it, yeah. ultimately when we're talking about this world in balance, it's, it's our values at the end of the day Science isn't going to tell us, you know, this is what you need. Science is going to help us understand how we get there. And it's a very different answer if we say we want to maintain all the species in the world or we want to, um, you know, maintain the ecosystem benefits for future generations. And then even with that, within that, you have to say, well, do we want to maintain the benefits for everyone to have a healthy, wonderful life or do we want people just surviving? And each value judgment creates a very different scenario of what that kind of future world we want to live in is. And I think we have to sort those values out now and all aim towards a specific goal together in the future. Um, can I just, sorry, but it's also whose values. 
You know, and I think that that's the big question of understanding really who's shaping those decisions. And yes. if you think about it historically, these decisions have been shaped by a really narrow group of people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually what makes me so optimistic and excited about our future is we're expanding the value sets that we include in our decisions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Egalitarian geographic distribution of <laughs> questions forces me to go to this direction with the guy that's wearing a shirt like mine. <laughs> it's a nice shirt, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I knew I liked it. Uh, this is uh, uh, more directed at Mustafa than just building on, on several things you've already said. But given the fact that we know that there's a lot of inequity in the world from the perspective of uh, different communities, different parts of the world, feeling the effects of behavior that has nothing to do with them. Mm -hmm. Do you feel there are, or what are some of the scalable international forums from your perspective that can really spread in some significant way the need for justice in this mm -hmm. regard? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good question. You know, I'm a grassroots person. So for me, it has to build from that, whether we're talking about in the global south or we're talking here in our country. Um, and, and the environmental justice movement has always been focused on that. You know, whether we're talking about the UN or some of the other, you know, institutions that folks see value in, most folks see value in. I know we have someone who doesn't, but um, I'm not going to go there, y'all. I promise I wouldn't go there. <laughs> um, I think that those, in conjunction with, one of the things that I like is that the United Nations and others began to pay attention to also some of the things that were happening in this country and holding our country accountable for some of the things we saw around water quality and some of the other issues. So I see value in those spaces, but I also see value in uh, those civic uh, organizations and institutions in other countries building partnerships with those that are here. Because for me, if you don't have a grassroots movement, then what you have are a number of well-meaning uh, folks who maybe have been blessed with privilege who are making decisions uh, for those who are still trying to get traction in that space. So I look at it a little different. Lots of times we say, well, if we could just get these institutions with large budgets, uh, with great thinkers to get engaged or, or to push, then that'll make the change happen. I think that that's one part of the paradigm, if you will. The other one is it has to be everyday folks seeing value in this. And people have to realize that they have power. I'll show you something. Everybody in the room say power. 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 You see how pitiful that was? <laughs> Folks didn't believe that you have power. Do me a favor real quickly. Grab the hand of the person next to you on the right-hand side. Grab their hand. Hi. Uh, My hands are that's all. <laughs> now I want everybody to say power again. Say power. Power. You see how much stronger that was? <laughs> now one, because I gave you some prep. <laughs> But two, here's the other dynamic that goes into the question you're talking about and ties back into a grassroots movement. When you have responsibility for someone else, when you touch someone else, it changes that dynamic because you're not in it by yourself anymore. And that, for me, is why a grassroots global movement is so important. And then having authentic, collaborative partnerships with those institutions that we all know exist, then we have a movement for change. It's that simple but we continue to place these barriers that separate us, that folks use for their own gain sometimes. And for me, that's how we change this dynamic, and that's how we bring balance back into this process, by making sure everyday people's voices are a driver in the process. I'm gonna start factoring in after each time Mustafa's 20 seconds for applause. <laughs> yeah. You excite people, which is great. Um, all right, let's go to you in the middle. First, thank you very much for a stimulating conversation. Um, just, I guess, to face the elephant in the room, the thing that's woefully out of balance, of course, is the numbers of us. Mm -hmm. And I have not heard anybody say, but I haven't been to every panel, at this festival, uh, how do we encourage people where the birth rate is a lot greater than it is in America from not having as many kids? How do we get them into that mindset that it would be better for themselves, better for the planet, better for everybody if we didn't have kids? I'm, ch I'm childless, by the way, so I've already given at the office. <laughs> um, 
uh, so I'm not advocating, you know, murdering people, which someone once thought I was advocating when I said this. Um, so I just would like to hear somebody here say this. Does National Geographic have any programs where you go and try to encourage, I don't, I don't even know how you would do this. You encourage women, do you, I mean, what do you do? But this is the big issue and yeah. we have to deal with it. I, Before you answer, I wanna add an addendum to that. So um, either answer that question or answer the cousin question, which is... I gotta answer, it's the yeah. cousin. <laughs> <laughs> the land consumption. Uh, yeah. Consumption, right, which is exactly where I was gonna go. Um, whether the, the, the real issue is consumption of a specific subsection of the overall rapidly growing population mm -hmm. and controlling that. Yeah. Okay. Do you need a moment? Um, <laughs> well, I wanna say, so that question comes up a lot when we think about using these technologies for malaria. Mm. That um, being which of the two? Population control. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, I actually find it, I don't like the, no, no offense to you, but I actually really don't like the question. And I know it's something we think a lot about the capacity of our earth and how much humans can place on it. Um, but I think that we can be so much more nuanced in the way that we're gonna think about that consumption being part of it. Um, and also again, knowing that when we make statements like that, I feel like that's still from a certain value set of a Western, of our Western, you know, at least I can say from my Western perspectives. Um, and so I think we have to be very careful um, talking about things that way. Um, and I just had to say that because it's something that mm -hmm. I feel deeply um, mm -hmm. that needs to be kind of mm -hmm. Jonathan, yeah. Well, I, uh, in the introduction or, or in the beginning, I was talking about, um, you know, 60% of biomass being in, in um, livestock and, and 36. Uh, um, we're looking at most of mammal biomass being converted for our use. And I think that is out of balance. And I think uh, we definitely need to address that. And people often say, well, there's population, but then it's all about consumption. And yes, it is a lot about consumption, but it's also about population. And we have to think about both these issues. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's a very difficult issue to, to look at. And if we do, and, and, and if you experience environments where you've had this massive population growth, there are many challenges for um, the communities. And a lot of the women don't want to have uh, to be put under the pressure that they're, that they're under. Um, but what, the way that we're dealing with the National Geographic is just working with partners, working in locations, listening to communities, and listening to what those communities want. Um, and for example, Greg Carr in Gorongosa, um, there's uh, a massive effort with female education. And um, there, that, uh, that program is uh, in, in inspiring that you know, whole generation. And uh, women have more control over their lives and then they can just make the decisions that, are, that they would make naturally. And uh, that's where we, f we feel we're having the greatest success in that space. Mm -hmm. Can we just take it again? This is on. Um, it's not just about consumption, there's the other side of the equation, and that is waste. And that is the human need for space and roads. I mean, you put a human on the planet, they want more than just to consume, they make other, they have other footprints. So that has to be considered too. So. I agree. It's yeah. also this idea of thinking that somehow humans are inherently bad for our planet. And I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that it's again about how we create relationships with each other and with our planet, that it can actually be something that can be really, create a really beautiful future. And from a justice perspective, weighting the impact of different humans. Yeah. Because different players on the planet are consuming things and in very producing different waste in different ways, and, and that needs to be taken into consideration, it seems, as we attempt to I, get to the... I agree with all that, but, but let's just remember we are one of probably 10 million species on this planet. And we have to have respect first for ourselves and then each other, but then that drives empathy for the rest of life. And I think we have to have that holistic view um, uh, or we're never gonna get to a true planet in balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Good ending, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that was the perfect ending note. Um, and <laughs> so, the yeah. cue of dimmed lights tells us we're, we're done. But I do think, just to resonate um, and echo, uh, I do think this is a celebration of cleverness uh, and of possibility. Uh, um, and I also think that asking continual questions in the direction away from out of balance and toward balance as a general goal is, uh, is worthy. So thank you. Yeah.